This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Zion United Church of Christ here in Union, Missouri for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Throughout this calendar year, we've been following the gospel according of Mark all the way through. Um, And now we're getting to those final chapters. And as I've said a couple times in sermons over the past week, um, Mark is doing his own thing. We have our tradition. Every year during Holy Week, and particularly on Good Friday, we read through the Passion story. And what we hear oftentimes is a mixture of the four Gospels to kind of weave a story that plays out in our minds as we hear this tale. Mark, as he always is, a little bit more direct. It's a little little shorter and to the point. And so as we approach the Garden of Gethsemane and as we hear Jesus' arrest um, in his early hearing, Um, or his first of two hearings today, we try to do a couple things. We try to really imagine what is playing out in that gospel story and also try to hear it for the first time because we know we hear these stories year after year after year. And so in some ways we are trying to see what God is up to today, here and now, what new word might be breathed into these ancient texts. And so as we approach these texts, it gives us an opportunity to take the the drama of Holy Week, to take the the grind of Lent away from it, and simply on uh, this, you know, beautiful day in Franklin County, um, and simply hear and imagine what God is up to in this time and place. And so we'll be getting into the the scripture here in a little bit, um, and really going through this story Um, that is a critical turning point in the gospel according to Mark, and one in which has uh, shaped our theology as we know it today. Um, But we'll get to that in a moment. I have a few announcements for the good of our community, Um, and really it's just two. Um, Today is a doubleheader. So this service is nice and lovely and great, Um, but in a couple hours I'll also be leading a worship at Camp Moval, which is also going to be really exciting. I won't be wearing my suit out there, I don't think, um, I do think I have just enough time to go back home and change before making my way out there. We'll see how on time I am. Um, it, I do plan on starting by 11. I do. So we'll see how well that works. I'm usually on time. But everybody is invited to go out there. So I know some people are just only going out to move out today. Um, we'll be worshiping at Vesper, at, at Vesper Point. And then immediately following um, that worship service, the benediction will also have a meal blessing. And then we'll head up to the dining hall and eat. Um, and then for the next couple hours after the meal, um, you'll have an opportunity to either go to the pool or to the waterfront or go on some of the hiking trails around Moval. Um, so if you're interested, please do that. If Moval isn't your scene, I want to uh, announce what I announced last week, um, is that today, I think from 11 or maybe from noon to 6 p.m. Um, at Fimeo Sage UCC in Augusta, um, that they're having one of their meals. So I think it's $15 per adult. Um, they're having a whole bunch of other events. There's live music. All this kind of stuff is happening. Um, what, they do these summer picnics every, uh, every year. Um, and, but in particular, this year is really important for Femi Osage um, because their bridge had washed out a couple months back. And so they're also trying to, I don't know exactly how you're supposed to get there. Um, I'm sure there'll be some signs <laughs> seeing as how their bridge washed out. Um, but they're also trying to, uh, yeah, raise funds for that. So if you don't plan on going out to Movell, or if you do, um, and you're wondering what you might do for dinner after having a nice little uh, potluck out at camp, um, Maybe you go up to Augusta for the, for the evening. Um, so with that, it is time to worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Holy One. Give thanks to God in the congregation. God's works delight, inspire, challenge, and uphold us. Praise the Holy One. Give thanks to God in the congregation. Righteousness endures forever. The covenant is everlasting. Praise the Holy One. Give thanks to God in the congregation. Honoring God leads to wisdom. Let us praise the Holy One forever. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Let us pray. Holy, Holy God, God, we, we come, come together, together in your, your presence to offer worship, thanksgiving, and praise. We, we remember your covenant and, and acknowledge your abiding presence. presence. Envelop us in your glory. Strengthen us to confront the weariness of the world. Challenge us to spread the good news. And empower us to be the church you have created us to be. Amen. The first reading of scripture is from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 52 from the Common English Bible. Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. Jesus said to them, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to feel despair and was anxious. He said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert. Then he went a short distance farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if possible, he might be spared the time of suffering. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. Again, he left them and prayed, repeating the same words. And again, when he came back, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know how to respond to him. He came a third time and said to them, will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. Suddenly, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, came with a mob carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests, legal experts, and elders. His betrayer had given them a sign. Arrest the man I kiss and take him away under guard. As soon as he got there, Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi, then he kissed him. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew a sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. Jesus responded, have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like an outlaw? Day after day, I was with you, teaching in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all his disciples left him and ran away. One young man and a disciple was wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They grabbed him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn number 471.
Please be seated. Brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ, it is good and right to go to God in the spirit of confession that we may transform our hearts and lives into continued following in the path of Christ. Would you please join me in our prayer of confession? Holy God, we find wisdom in your word, in your presence, and in your way. Help us to follow the path of love, community, and sharing. Open our awareness to the unmet needs in our community and the ways we may meet them. Open our compassion to notice those who too often go without being acknowledged. Open our schedules to be present to your spirit, our neighbors, and ourselves. Fill us with wisdom, peace, and hope to move boldly toward new life and the fullness of joy. Amen. Beloved, God honors our request for wisdom, individually and most importantly, collectively. We have the wisdom, discernment, and understanding necessary to meet the challenges of the day, to live a life pleasing to the Holy One, and to participate in the coming of God's kingdom. We are forgiven. Praise be to God. Amen. Friends, it is out of the generosity that you have given to this ongoing work and mission of the church which supports this congregation. We are so grateful for everyone who has continued to contribute over the years. As always, we don't pass a plate during the offertory, but we leave our plate outside of the sanctuary during before and after service. You can always donate by bringing a check to the church at any time during the week or by using our online giving platform. Would you please rise in body or in spirit? and join me in singing our doxology. Generous and wise God, you give freely and we receive freely. So in us discernment, understanding, and wisdom to be good stewards of the bounty we receive and the resources we have earned. Let us treat them all as gifts to be shared so that none will be in want or need to live full and abundant lives. Amen. You may be seated. The second reading picks up where we left off with our first reading. This is the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 through 72. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and legal experts gathered. Peter followed him from a distance, right into the high high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the guards, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests in the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many brought false testimony against him, but they contradicted each other. Some stood to offer false witness against him, saying, We heard him saying, I will destroy this temple constructed by humans, and within three days I will build another, one not made by humans. But their testimonies didn't even agree on this point. Then the high priest stood up in the middle of the gathering and examined Jesus. Aren't you going to respond to the testimony these people have brought against you? But Jesus was silent and didn't answer. Again, the high priest asked, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the human one sitting on the right side of the almighty and coming on the heavenly clouds. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard his insult against God, what do you think? They all condemned him 
He deserves to die. Some began to spit on him. Some covered his face and hit him, saying, Prophesy. Then the guards took him and beat him. Meanwhile, Peter was below in the courtyard. A woman, one of the high priest's servants, approached and saw Peter warming himself by the fire. She stared at him and said, You were also with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand what you're saying. And he went outside into, into the outer courtyard, a rooster crowed. The female servant saw him and began a second time to say to those standing around, this man is one of them. But he denied it again. A short time later, standing around again, said to Peter, you must be one of them because you are also a Galilean. But he cursed and swore, I don't know this man you're talking about. At that very moment, a rooster crowed a second time. Peter remembered what Jesus told him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down, sobbing. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And you may remain seated for our next hymn soon and very soon, hymn number 523. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. After nailing his 95 theses against the practice of indulgences, Martin Luther was far from finished writing. He continued to preach and publish against the tyrannical practices and policies of the church and the pope in particular. Soon after he continued these writings, a paper bull was issued by Pope Leo X demanding him to renounce all of these new writings and teachings. But rather than renouncing his beliefs, Martin Luther called the public together and burned the papal bull. As you might imagine, uh, this didn't sit well uh, with the papacy, and so he was censured. The emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, summoned Luther 
fearful of execution, uh, Luther's prince, the presiding kind of governor of sorts, Frederick of Saxony, obtained an agreement of safe passage as he went to go and stand trial. In April of 1521, some four years after the nailing of the 95 Theses to the church door, when questioned on whether or not he would recant and take back what he said, Luther determined that to take back what he had said would only add to the tyranny he sought to end. Tradition tells us that Luther ended his statement by saying, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. God help me. While the council deliberated, which was going to take a period of a few days, if not weeks, Luther left as was right for his uh, safe passage. So he was sent home. But before arriving at home, his prince, Frederick of Saxony, staged an ambush. He kidnapped Luther and hid him away in a castle in Wartburg where Luther remained there until the threat of his arrest died down as his theological ideas gained popularity throughout the region. In In the fall of 1880, Carl Emil Otto, a pastor, professor, and the fourth president of what is now known as Eden Theological Seminary, was tried for heresy. While the controversy was stirring, many of his students in Marthasville protested, for Otto was a beloved professor. He was known for his command of the ancient languages, the interpretation of scripture, and the conviction of his teaching. After a failed attempt to censure Reverend Otto by the seminary board, an appeal to the Evangelical Synod of North America was sent. What was challenged was the result of Otto's exegetical approach, the way in which he drew meaning from the texts. The particulars of the challenge were Otto's interpretation of Paul's letter to the Romans, and in particular, his exegesis around Genesis 3 and the nature of sin and atonement. What Otto believed and taught was a critical approach. He took the scriptures seriously, but not always literally. He recognized the importance of a story and how it compels us and continues to compel us. What Otto concluded, which challenged the church's catechisms and dogma, was that atonement theory, which claims Christ was the atoning sacrifice for humans, was a product of tradition and not of scripture. In other words, for Otto, the Bible never tells us that Jesus needed to die in order for God to forgive our sins. And so this was thought to be too controversial for the Synod, and that it would split those who were attending the seminary and the local congregations apart. And in a vote of 47 to 9, the Synod declared their lack of confidence. Otto resigned from the seminary and membership in the Synod, and he was excommunicated from the church for heresy. Only five years later, Otto was reinstated. It wasn't as divisive as the council thought, as the synod once thought. And over the decades following his trial, he continued to preach and teach, taking on a variety of roles throughout the region. Otto would be welcomed back into the synod. His students and those who he taught and pastored continued to be influenced by his devotion to scripture, his conviction of Christ, and his compassion for the wider church. On the night of his arrest, Jesus would be brought to trial and convicted of heresy. This was an interreligious happening, just like Otto, just like Luther. It was happening within the powers, the halls of power within a religious setting. Only hours before, Jesus and his disciples had been journeyed back to the Mount of Olives, to a garden called Gethsemane. After they had finished their supper, Jesus needed to pray like he always usually did. He had his doubts and his fears. He had asked his disciples to stay awake. Maybe he wanted them to keep watch or simply keep him company or simply he didn't want to return to his disciples and catch them sleeping. But they couldn't. They constantly fell asleep. And after some time, Judas appeared with a mob, 
formed by the elders and priests. After a kiss, a small skirmish took place. The slave of the high priest lost an ear. Jesus called for everyone to stop fighting and criticized the whole event for taking place tonight for this whole undertaking to happen the way it was. After a quick statement, Jesus was arrested and he went with them without a fight while the disciples scattered. One of them lost all of his clothes apparently in the fleeing according to Mark's tale that lost his outer cloak and he was running away naked in the night from the garden. I don't know if Mark is thinking this is funny um, or if this is simply just one of those things that happened in the scattering and every, in the chaos of that night. On the arrest, Ched Myers writes in Binding the Strong Man. He says, that garden scene, it must be said, reeks of the overkill so typical of covert state action against civil dissidents. The secret signal, the surprise attack at night, and of course the heavily armed contingent all implies that the authorities expected armed resistance." End quote. By the time this whole chaotic scene has played out, we recognize how often this kind of story has played out through history. Somebody who is preaching a different theology, a different practice, and one who had, not, up until this point, they hadn't raised an army. Jesus didn't come into Jerusalem to conquer it, at least not in the way that Rome had years before. And so, like, again, like it happens so through, often throughout history, there was an attempted silencing of Jesus' ideals from within his own community. Chad Myers goes on to say, everything has gone sour. The discipleship community, as has happened so often throughout history, has buckled under the boot of security forces, its dreams of a new order shattered by the brute reality of state power. Jesus, now alone, goes to stand in a kangaroo court with no hope of justice." End quote. From the garden, the arrest of Jesus now appears before the Sanhedrin, the elders in the court system. Jesus was arrested before any charges were brought before him. But from the onset, we know that due process was thrown aside. A nighttime trial was forbidden, in rabbinic, was forbidden in rabbinic Judaism. So many other protocols according to both scriptural law and custom were put aside in order to expedite Jesus' trial and hearing. By the end of the night, picking up in verse 61, again the high priest asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the human one sitting on the right side of the Almighty and coming on the heavenly clouds. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard his insult against God. What do you think? They all condemned him. He deserves to die. By the end of the night, Jesus gives reason for his arrest. However, the Greek in this text is unclear. Ego me can be translated either I am or am I. If it's to be understood as declarative, Jesus answering I am would have been sufficient affirmation of Jesus' blasphemy. However, if Jesus responded am I, it shows congruency between this statement and the statement before Pilate, which we'll read next week, when Jesus responds you say so. In the other Gospels, Jesus either remains silent or turns the question around. And so you would hear throughout the four Gospel stories, it would be congruent with all of those that this was more of a, a question. A you say so. Am I? Am I the Christ? Why are you here? At the trial, either way, Jesus' opponents render him guilty and begin to beat and mock him. We have to remember that this wasn't a trial, only a political silencing. At the end of this trial and hearing, the crowd begins clamoring, and by the crowd, it's the, the crowd of the elders, of the priests, not the same crowds that were with Jesus as he approached Jerusalem, not the same crowds that had gathered around him when he was teaching in the temple, but these were the ones who helped arrest him. These were the mobs of people. These were the high court, the elders, the people who benefited the most from things staying exactly the way they are. Those crowds started clamoring. 
So at the end of this trial and hearing, the crowds begin clamoring for his condemnation and death. What is odd is that they get ready to hand him over to Pilate. And like I said, we'll talk more about Pilate next week when we get there. But handing him over to Pilate is odd. And when I say it, it doesn't seem very odd, but it is. The law codes of the Hebrew Bible state that a person convicted of blasphemy should be stoned to death. Death by crucifixion was a Roman institution. It is how the empire would condemn runaway slaves and rebellious agitators to death. Crucifixion was how the empire preserved the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. In this trial, both the local collaborators, the local elites, and the Roman Empire are linked together in their attempt to preserve the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And it's this idea of the Pax Romana that peace comes through violence, corruption. It comes through force, that we can achieve peace by being simply more violent, more deadly, more authoritative than everyone else. Through the military might of the Roman Empire and the strong arm of the local authorities, peace could be achieved. Everybody knew their place in society, and if you tried to break from your station, the empire felt that the Pax Romana was being threatened and would protect itself at any cost. And so the trial of Jesus reveals to us that his death was inevitable, not necessary, through the corrupted local temple authorities who collaborated with the Roman Empire, what we realize is that the elite in Jesus' time were more sided with the empire than with their own faith and tradition. Jesus' mission to bring about the kingdom of God, to proclaim its arrival, and his commitment to nonviolent resistance would one day feel the full weight of the Pax Romana. In return, Jesus' ministry was only the beginning of his resistance to the empire. While Jesus was resisting the empire and his local collaborators, we know that he was also alone for a while. The disciples had abandoned him. Peter was close, following close behind in the courtyard. He could probably overhear these conversations, hear these false testimonies, hear what was happening. And again and again, Peter was given a chance to align himself with Jesus, and he denied him. And so what we can hear, right, is that there might not be that much grace in this text. It's hard to spin a word of love, compassion, or saving grace from Christ's betrayal, abandonment, arrest, conviction, and ultimately what we'll get to in a few weeks, his crucifixion. So what does this story tell us about the nature of Christ and the, particularly the path of discipleship? First, we want to consider Mark's community. See, during the Messianic movements, during the Great Rebellion in Jerusalem, the decades, a couple decades following Jesus' death, followers of the way would have been betrayed, abandoned, and denied. Many covert operations under darkness, one-sided hearings would come and strip them of their freedoms and oftentimes their lives. Knowing who to trust, staying true to your identity, your calling was challenging. Mark's community was struggling with what to do next. Should they flee? Should they side with the empire or the rebels? Should they do something different? Could they do so nonviolently? The story of Jesus' arrest and trial would have been all too familiar for Mark's community. But what we also know is that as much as the disciples fled that night, the story didn't end there. Right, like we're talking about it today, some 2,000 years later. Despite all of the denial, despite all of the abandonment, despite all of the ways in which people have messed up over the years, we're still talking about it. And it's this ability to talk about it, to confront the ways in which our own fears can get the best of us, the ways in which we can deny our callings and what God is calling us to do in these moments, the ways in which we can often side with the status quo or the ways and powers of the day do not need to be our end. 
Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan in their book, The Last Week, provide consolation for Christians, specifically for those enduring the difficult times of the rebellion, and for us now. They say, and I quote, the framing of Jesus' confession by Peter, Peter's denials, offers those Christians a triple consolation. First, those who imitated Jesus rather than Peter for their courage. Second, even those who imitated Peter rather than Jesus are consoled with the hope of repentance and forgiveness. Mark says that after his denials, Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, the cock, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. And third, neither denials nor even betrayals are the worst sin against Jesus or God. The worst sin is despair, a loss of faith that repentance will always, always obtain forgiveness. Judas has broken down, wept, and repented. If Jesus, Judas had broken down, wept, and repented, he too would have been forgiven. As much as this story can be hard to hear and hard to imagine ourselves partaking in this story, in the end, Jesus is forgiving, welcoming, and understanding. In the end, Jesus refuses to give the empire what it wants. He refuses to fight on their terms because he had no desire to win any fight. Jesus wasn't here to fight. He wasn't here to wage a war. What has, what has Jesus been here for? What does Mark say he's been here for? I hope this is starting to get annoying. What has Jesus been preaching from the first page? He's here. Repent and believe. Change your hearts and lives. I give you this good news. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, has arrived. It has come near. It is at hand. Change your hearts and lives. Repent and believe. Transform your life. In this harrowing moment, Jesus once again reveals the brokenness of our lives and the institutions we have created and gives us the saving grace, the opportunity to not let the story end with our worst moments. In every generation, there are Martin Luther's and Carl Emil Otto's who challenge their own communities to more fo closely follow in the way of Christ. They challenge norms with a vision of what could be. History shows us how Luther and Otto's ideas gain traction by challenging their ideas and beliefs and improve to be more effective, loving, and dedicated to the way of Christ. But there are many others whose ideas rose to the surface that were silenced long before they took root. And perhaps even more, there are many names whose ideas rose to the surface and latched onto our worst fears, prejudices, and malice. There are plenty of people who, in the name of Christ, have put forth theology that is killing us. As Christians following in the way, as citizens concerned with our communities, as human beings, mindful of the humanity or lack thereof in the world, stories like Jesus' arrest and trial remind us that we have created the systems we live in. And if we have created the systems we live in, then we have the power to do something about them when they fail us and when they fail others. There, are, there were plenty of people that night on Jesus' arrest and betrayal just doing their job, just following orders, just going along with it, just maintaining the status quo. Let's not upset the apple cart. There were others simply trying to maintain their power and control and silence a troublemaker who threatened their grip on the region. But it offers us again another chance to Recognize that our worst moments are opportunities for learning. We can let them just simply be our worst moments. We can just try to forget them and ignore them all the times that we have denied or betrayed, not just Jesus, by the way, but who God has called us to be, who we know we are at our core. 
How many times have we let ourselves down by not sticking true to who we are called to be? I'm reminded of the physicality of courage in this moment, right? Because we talk about having a strong backbone as being true to who you are. But to engage your backbone, to make sure it's standing up straight, to have good posture, means that you're leading with your heart exposed. Right? Because you can cower away and protect your vital organs. Or you can stand firm with your heart on the line. Letting that be your guide. Letting that be your way forward. So this story just reminds me of all of the ways in which our own communities can eat us up if we let them. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we do when we are faced with new ideas, particularly ones that challenge our beliefs, our identities, and sometimes even our pocketbooks? I'm reminded that it was Al Gore who popularized the phrase, an inconvenient truth. It's true. How much of our lives, inconvenience, is what gets in the way? We're too tired, too sick, too busy, too worried, I don't have enough time, money, or the resource to do anything about it anyway. Just a little too inconvenient. But how many inconveniences along the way have led us astray from truly following the way Christ has been calling us? What theologies do we need to challenge in our own time today to bring forth God's kingdom, to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that it is near? And so as we get ready to go to God in prayer, as we get ready to go about our day and our week, let's just take a moment to take a few deep breaths, to lower our shoulders, to unclench our jaws, and remember that God hasn't brought us this far to only bring us this far. There is good that is ours to do, and that if we are mindful of our prejudices, if we're mindful of our identities, if we're mindful of where our backbones are in any given moment, that we have an opportunity to lead with our hearts even when we have failed, even when we've come up short, even when we have denied, abandoned, or simply just let happen what happens in the world. So, forgiveness abounds. The story is far from over. Well, we're going to be done with it in a couple weeks, but this story is far from over. It continues to reveal more truth and light in our time and place. And we must be particularly careful when we start shutting down new ideas that rise up in our congregations, in our communities, within our own faith. Because those voices might actually be the ones showing us a better way. So, let us go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this opportunity to come together in your name, to discern your word and will in our lives, to make new these stories that they may come alive in us and lead us more fully into your kingdom. Grant us the courage and wisdom, O Holy One, as we continue to follow in your way. So God, we pray for the world and for all who live within it. We pray for communities near and far communities we know well and the communities we will never know. May your peace, may your love, may your justice prevail. We pray for the communities that we call home, the places and spaces that are nearest and dearest to our hearts. May your peace, may your justice, may your love prevail. We pray for our neighbors, for the strangers who cross our paths, and for those we deem our enemies. May your peace, 
May your justice, may your love prevail. We pray for our loved ones, those nearest and dearest to our hearts. May your mercy, may your forgiveness, may your love and kindness and grace prevail. And we pray for ourselves. Pray for the wisdom, the courage, the grace, and the peace that you can provide. And God, just because we don't always know where we're going doesn't mean we don't know who we're following. And so we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our closing hymn, number 72, Great is Thy Faithfulness. 72.
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine graciously upon you. And may you go knowing that there is nothing you can do, neither heights nor depths nor things in the past nor things to come nor life nor death nor betrayal nor abandonment that will ever separate you from the love of God which we have come to know in Jesus the Christ. Go in peace this day and always. Amen? Amen.